Good morning and welcome to St Mary Magdalene with St Martin in Addiscombe in East Croydon. Behind me you can probably hear the sound of an aeroplane, the first, the second one we've had flying over here this week, and the sound of children's voices in our preschool. Life is trying to regain some of what we once called normality. Over the church behind me yesterday evening was the most magnificent rainbow, rainbow a picture of God's hope and love for us. So as we, together, in the face of all that might divide us, come before Jesus, filled with his Holy Spirit, filled with the love of the Father, let us unite this morning in our worship and praise. Come Holy Spirit, come and fill our hearts, set our hearts on fire with love for you. Amen. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, good morning everyone and uh, we have come to worship the Lord this morning and to hear from him. The Bible says, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. And the Bible also says when you know, Jesus said, he is looking for true worshippers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And he said that the time is here. Let's come to the Lord, lay every burden before him. Because we have a wonderful Father who is very mindful of us. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us join our music team to sing our first song and after which Mike and Ruth will lead us in children's focus.
things in our Bible books today that we're going to share with you. Let's see what the first thing is. It's a Bible. I was given that when I was about seven or eight years old, when I asked Jesus to be my friend. And that choice that I made has changed the way that I behave because I try to act in the way that he would. Now, we're going to do some scenarios with you and you are going to have a choice about how to behave. So when I've given you the three, scenario, the three different ways you could behave, I want you to turn to the adult next to you and tell them what you think you would do. And then Mike is going to tell us what he would do. Okay, let's go for the first thing in the box. First thing we have is a mug. Now I know this is one of Ruth's favourite elephant mugs. So, Mike, you're in the kitchen on your own and you accidentally break the mug. Oh dear. Do you blame someone else living in our house? Do you hide the pieces hoping that no one will find them? Or do you come and say sorry? Hmm. Well, what would you do if you just have a chat to the adult next to you and tell them what you would do? For me, I think, I know you'd be very sad, but I think what I'd do is come and tell you about it. And I think that's what Jesus would have wanted. Because I know you'd be sad, but it would be better to get it sorted straight away and come and say sorry and get you a new one. I think you're right. Okay, let's see what the second item is. Ooh, 10 pound note this time. So, you're in the front garden, walking down the road, and on the pavement in front of you, you see a 10 pound note. Ooh, how exciting. What are you going to do? Are you going to pick it up and put it quickly in your pocket? Are you going to leave it where it is? Or are you going to find an adult so that they can try and find out who the money belongs to? Mm. Again, children, what would you do? Tell the adult with you what you might do with that £10 note. It would be very tempting to actually take it and put it in my pocket and spend it on something. But then I think people might be, somebody might be very, very sad for losing that and they might actually need to spend it on something important. So I think Jesus would want me to hand it in and see who it actually belonged to. Good answer. Third thing in the box. plasters a box of plasters so again you're at the front of your house when suddenly bang somebody falls off their scooter right in front of you what are you going to do are you going to run indoors quickly and hide are you going to ask them if they're okay or are you going to find an adult to help Hmm, again, what would you do, children? Tell the adult next to you what you might do in that situation. Well, I think Jesus really wanted us to help people. So I think you might want to ask the person if they're okay. But it might be better actually to go to your parents and tell them there's been an accident so they can come and help. I think you're right, Mike. And what I've noticed you do each time is you said to yourself, what would Jesus do? I think that's a good way. So how do we know what Jesus would do? Well, we read about Jesus in the Bible through mm -hmm. stories. And also we can ask the Holy Spirit to help us too. So shall we end with a prayer? Father God, help us to be a friend of Jesus and to change the way that we behave to the way that he would want us to. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike and Ruth, for that wonderful children's focus. We now come to a time of confession. Let us bring before the Lord the things that we have done in the past week that are not of the Lord's. Let's take a moment or two to just bring those things before the Lord and confess to him all that we have done wrong.
Let's say the prayer of confession together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives, who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Natsai and Jason will bring our readings for the day and after which Pete will expound the scriptures for us. Today's Bible reading is taken from Romans chapter 6 verses 1b to 11. Dying and rising with Christ. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly be with united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed of sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that he will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our reading for today is taken from the Gospel, according to St. Matthew, chapters 10, verses 24 to 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house, Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered and nothing secret that will not become known. For what I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul. In hell, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, Yet not one of them will fall to the ground, apart from your father, and even the hairs of your head are count all counted. So do not be afraid, you are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone therefore who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. 
Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. O Lord, you know our coming out and our going in. You even know the number of hairs on our heads. Speak to us now so that we would know your will as we explore your word. Amen. Now we've got two rather complicated readings today from Romans uh, 6 and Matthew 10. Um, And because of that, for reasons of time, I'm going to just focus on one of them. So if you've got a Bible uh, near to hand, then you might want to open up Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 11, which is what we will be looking at now. And imagine for a moment flight of great fancy that England and the United States are in the World Cup final. You've managed to get a ticket and your neighbour in the stand is an American, strangely recognisable, but you can't quite place him. As full time creeps up and the score is still nil-nil, you and the whole crowd are in a state of great tension and excitement. Extra time is called and the whistle is blown on that and still the score is nil-nil. In a burst of enthusiasm, you turn to your neighbour and you say, I bet you one billion pounds that England will win on penalties. Ha ha! Your neighbour says, you're on, and he shakes your hand. Of course, England doesn't win on penalties. What a foolish bet to make. But you and your neighbour both know that a one billion pound bet is fake. It's a hyperbole to express your excitement. Or do you? Suddenly it dawns on you that you know why you recognise your neighbour as Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world. He thinks that if anyone talks about betting a billion dollars, they must be uh, telling the truth. He took you entirely seriously and now you're stuck. You owe Jeff Bezos more than you could ever pay off, even if every penny you ever earned went to him. Luckily for you, Jeff enjoyed sitting next to you at the football and wants to be your friend. And he knows that friendship isn't easy when you owe the other person one billion pounds. So seeing your ashen face, he says to you, I want to make you a gift to say thank you for your scintillating conversation. And he writes you a cheque for one billion pounds. But now, he says, you owe me some money. Imagine your relief. I'm pretty sure you wouldn't seek a repeat by making another bet of a similar size. Now I doubt it takes too much of a leap of your imagination to recognise the metaphor here. Through our sin, through our turning away from God, we each accumulate a debt greater than anything we could ever repay. But God, for his love for us, gifts us forgiveness. What that gift actually means for us is what Paul is talking about in our passage in Romans today. Romans is the longest of Paul's letters. It's a great work of theology and the foundation for a lot of what Christians understand to have happened with Jesus's life, death and resurrection. It bears repeated reading. And if you've never read Romans all the way through, I would encourage it. But to help you through it, I suggest that you get a guide And the theologian Tom Wright has quite a gentle one. Look up Paul for everyone and Romans for more. Romans is particularly famous for what's called the doctrine of justification by faith. In other words, the Christian belief that there is nothing that we can do that causes God to forgive our sins except to believe in him and what Jesus did for us in the cross. That is to say, by grace, by the undeserved favour of God, we're made clean and brought into his presence. And in the run up to our passage in Romans today, Paul writes that the more sin that there has been, the more grace that there has been. In chapter 520, he writes, where the sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It's that theme that he's carrying on where we start today's passage. If there is more grace in forgiveness where there is more sin, 
then why not sin more? As Paul poses the question, should we continue to sin in order that grace might abound? Or as another version puts it, shall we keep on sinning so that God keeps on forgiving? We can have a little bit of a problem in reading these verses. Because although Paul answers that rhetorical question, of course not, by no means, any of us with any self-awareness know that we do still sin. When you become a Christian, you don't suddenly become perfect. At the moment we believe, repent and resolve to follow Jesus, we are, to use theological language, justified. We've received a pardon. In the eyes of God, our ultimate judge, we're now innocent. But we do keep on sinning and we keep on repenting and we are forgiven and we know that we're forgiven. In the eyes of many of the critics of the Christians at the time that Paul was writing, and in the eyes of many Jews and Muslims in particular today, this is a big problem in Christian theology. If your sin can be forgiven so simply, if there's a knockout blow to your guilt, as a friend of mine puts it, what deterrent is there to continued sin? There's a recognition that humans are sinful, but, so the argument goes, if we have to follow a law to be forgiven, then it, we require persistent work and improvement and the threat of punishment in order to make ourselves better, to make ourselves less likely to sin. But as Paul and the other apostles, such as James, saw clearly, this was wrong. Law and the threat of punishment was not enough to keep people from sin. Sin had too powerful a hold on people. The German philosopher Heinrich Heine is said to have uh, said on his deathbed, God will forgive me. That's his job. That's like us paying Jeff Bezos back using the money that he gave us and immediately making another billion pound bet. Jeff will cover my losses. That's his job. Of course it isn't. Just as no sane person would accept would expect Jeff Bezos to keep bailing out their extravagant bets, there's nothing required about God's forgiveness. It comes out of his love for us. Forgiveness is God's free gift, but there is one action that we need to take. We can't work for it, but we do need to do something. That action is that inspired by the Holy Spirit, we truly and honestly repent of what we have done that takes us away from God and resolve to follow him. Paul explains this in verses 2 and 3. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? He asks. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? What does that mean? His point is that if we have truly repented, if we have truly turned to Christ, it is not that we will no longer sin at all, but rather that sin is no longer our master. Christ is now our Lord. It's a matter of status. When we have a birthday, we don't feel any different at all, but our status has changed. We are legally a year older. When we get married, we don't feel any different. Well, we hopefully feel happy. But our status has changed, and with it, our responsibilities. It's the same, Paul says, in baptism. When we are baptised, when we publicly declare our faith in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and our determination to follow him, we're rejecting the controlling power of sin and binding ourselves to Christ. Our status has changed, and with it, the way that we should behave. It's important to say here that sometimes Christian believers are unable to be baptised. Uh, and, uh, and that doesn't make them any less recipients of God's grace. The verse baptizo in Greece means to immerse. Anyone who immerses themselves in Christ, who turns entirely to him as their Lord and resolves to follow him, is justified or receives God's full forgiveness. 
And there are some also we might worry about who have never heard of uh, Jesus and his actions for them, either because they're too young or because no one's ever told them. And for them, we can trust that God is just and God is merciful. We follow a good God. But if you haven't been baptised and if you have resolved to follow Jesus, then being baptised in the name of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit is how we declare that resolution. Do contact Amanda in the parish office to find out more. That moving away from our habits of sinfulness is a process. It isn't immediate. If, in theological language, the act of God's forgiveness of us is called justification, the process of our reflecting that forgiveness is called sanctification, the process of being made more holy. That's what Paul goes on to talk about here and over the next few chapters. If in baptism we are raised to newness of life, sin has no more mastery over us. And although these bodies, infected as they are with the consequences of sin, will die, we will be raised in a resurrection like his, Paul says, to live eternally for God. That eternal, incorruptible, sinless life is our future, but it casts its shadow back into our present. If that is what is promised to us through Christ's death and resurrection and our acceptance of God's forgiveness, then we should act like it now. Because God doesn't simply forgive us by overlooking what we have done with an admonition not to do it again. He forgives us instead by wiping the slate completely clean. It's as if in his sight we've never done anything wrong in the first place. His forgiveness is not transactional, it's transformational. And it's given, as Paul writes, once for all, through Jesus' action on the cross. So of course we shouldn't seek to sin so that we can get more forgiveness, because we know that we're already forgiven. If our attitude to the knowledge that we are fully forgiven, made totally pure, our sin wiped away as if it never happened in God's sight, if our attitude to that is to regard it as a free pass for more sin, well then we might want to question whether we truly repented in the first place. Whether we have truly accepted the gift that God has offered us through Jesus on the cross. Our actions reflect what we believe. Our horror at our own continual habits of sin reflects our appreciation of the forgiveness that God has given us. Paul refers to that a little later in Romans. He says, referring to himself, what I do, I do not want to do, and what I do not do, I want to do. This is, this is the habit of sin. And yet the horror at that, the recognition that that is not the way that we should be living and a determination to change those habits with the help of the Holy Spirit reflects what we believe. That is, that is our appreciation of the forgiveness that God has given us. Calculate yourselves, Paul writes in verse 11, dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. That is, calculate like the totting up of a cash register at the end of a day. Your calculation informs you of what is already true. You adding up the pound notes and pound coins and five pound notes in the till doesn't make a difference to what's actually there, but it allows us to see that reality and to act as if that is the reality. We're called to see the reality of our future risen selves and to live in that newness of life right now. Our response, the only adequate response to this calculation, is obedience. It is submission to God's authority and determination to do his will. We should not need the driving force of law to whip us into obedience but the attractive force of God's overwhelming love and generosity, which requires us to do his will. Of course, we'll stumble. Of course, we'll make mistakes. And through God's loving mercy, we are promised continual forgiveness. 
but we can never go back to what we were without Jesus. Where sin had dominion, where sin had authority, now God has dominion. We have a new life, one that draws us into obedience, and with all our being, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we must strive to obey. Now we can't do that alone, so let's pray. Lord Jesus, the true extent of all that you have done for us is beyond our imaginations. But we know that through your actions we are made clean. So send your Holy Spirit, we pray, to fill us now so that we can live our lives in obedience to you, in reflection of your forgiveness. Amen. Let us take a few moments to think about what Peter said and how we apply that to our everyday life. Now Sanctia will lead us in our intercessions. Lord Jesus, you call us. We come as we are to worship you. We come with our strengths and our weaknesses, with our hopes and our heartaches. We come as we are, knowing you will welcome us. We come now to pray for the needs of the world. Loving Father, we pray for the Church. We thank you for all the outreach that is possible because of technology enabling others to experience church services in their own homes. We ask your blessing on Amanda and Brian and the rest of the team who are working in very different circumstances to bring us your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, during this time of crisis, we have had time to reflect on the ways of the world. We realise that we have not been good stewards of your creation. This time of lockdown has made us more aware of the natural world. We notice the air is clean and fresh. Without noisy vehicles on the road, we have been able to appreciate birdsong and nature. Help us to realise that we must take more care of your marvellous handiwork. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the government as they discuss the best possible ways in which to ease lockdown. Guide them to make wise decisions so that we will not experience another peak in the pandemic. May they uphold Christian values in all that they do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember all frontline workers, doctors, nurses and other NHS workers, all those who have continued to work in food retail, for public transport workers, police, refuse collectors, postmen, milkmen and delivery drivers, for teachers and carers and so many others. We ask for their protection and safety and we give thanks for their selfless dedication. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift to you those who have found themselves in difficulty from losing their livelihood because of the pandemic. We pray for those without enough food and give thanks that the government will be providing school meals to those in need throughout the summer holidays. We ask that more will be done for those experiencing poverty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, comfort and strengthen them and give them renewed hope in you, their Heavenly Father. Let us remember those whose minds are troubled or anxious and ask that your peace may rest upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for our families and friends. Bless and protect them and surround them with your love. We ask your blessing on all children. We pray for those who have returned to school. Protect them and keep them safe, 
as they adapt to new ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort those who have lost loved ones recently. May we remember those who have departed this life and are now in the fullness of your kingdom. Finally, Lord, we pray for your peace in the world. Let us remind ourselves to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us reaffirm our faith in God by sharing in the Apostles' Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. When Jesus came and stood among them, he said, Peace be with you. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. If you have someone you can share a sign of the peace with in your home with you now, please take the moment to do that.
His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children, and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. And with your whole church throughout the world, we lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. As our Saviour taught us, so we now pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ. The blood of Christ. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. 
After this morning's service at 11 o'clock, St Mary's will be open for private prayer until 12.30. When you come into church, please would you observe the two metre rule of being apart from one another. And as you come in, you'll find little footprint signs where you can stand to wait because you must sanitise your hands, clean your hands before you um, enter somewhere to sit, find somewhere to sit. Once you've done that, you will find that there's a, another stand which enables you, if you want to, to pick up the Bible readings for today or some prayers that you might like to use and also an order for a morning prayer if you want to use that liturgy quietly your own. You don't have to take one, but if you do, please keep it and take it home. Don't leave it behind. And then as you come around the church, you'll see it looks a little bit like um, um, a building site or a police site. We've marked off areas where you may sit. When you see this cross marked on a pew, that's where you may sit. And what will happen is when you leave, every seated cross will be cleaned by one of our volunteer cleaners. So we know the church has been sanitised for the next group. You will also see that only certain pews can be moved and that it's very clear where you should sit. So when you come, come for peace, come for reflection, come for stillness, come for quiet, and come in order to draw closer to God who is waiting to draw close to you. I want to thank Anand very much for leading us today and Peter for speaking and for all of you who've taken part in readings and prayers and recording and in editing. We're going to hear just as we finish our service the blessing sung in Tamil which is the language that many of our neighbours and quite a number of our church uh, family know very well so we can join with them listening as I'm sure they'll join in uh, with the blessing song. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you, now and always. Amen. Be blessed and go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.
for us and makes every crooked part straight for us and we thank you for your presence lord we thank you for your presence lord our diam namele nam kudumbangal mele nam pillaigal mele nam sandarigal mele our samugam nam munne nam maruge nam pinne our prashnam namme moodude avar endrum nammode avar dayavu nam mele nam kudumbangal mele nam pillaigal mele nam sandadigal mele avar samugam nam munne nam maruge nam pinne avar prashnam namme moodude avar endrum namode avar dayavu namme 